Uh, verses 1 and 2. Listen to these words here. To get us started. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in the heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much busyness, and a fool's voice with many words. Amen. Amen. So, very important words to get us started as our topic is submitting to God's agenda in worship. Notice just a few things here. He says, guard your steps. When you go to the house of God, guard them, be careful, is what he's saying. Why do you think he's saying, be careful when you go to the house of God? Why should we be careful? What is it about God that we should be careful with? Well, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. He's a consuming fire, okay. Mighty lion. He's a mighty lion, that's good, yes. I think you need to show him respect when you're approaching him, too. Mm -hmm. Right, and respect. Reverence. Thinking unworthy thoughts or doing unworthy deeds and be repentant for the ones you've done. Mm -hmm. Right. Amen. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say there's just uh, so many things that will keep you, or oh, when you're proceeding, that will keep you away from God. Mm -hmm. There are distractions. There's your own personal agenda. Uh, it's so easy. To submit to your own desires, mm. as to make yourself secondary, humble yourself God. Right, right, and that's why that's why he says, "Let your words be few." You know, quiet. Yeah, you don't go in there all haughty and arrogant, and you know, uh, God must want to know what I have to offer him today. You know? James said, "Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry." Yeah. Right, right, and that, that's that's with one another let alone when you're approaching God, right? How much more so then? That's good. All right, so why is, we, we uh, talked a little bit about it, some of these thoughts we had flushed, in, you know, flushed it out a little bit, but why is submission so difficult for us? And how does this become an issue, particularly in worship? Self, ego. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want to submit to anybody. Right. Because we like to be our own God. Right. Well, it's a question of control, too. I think for all of us, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, I uh, want to be in control of all of our activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so it's our choice of free will. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. It talks about the sacrifice of fools. What, what comes to mind is uh, Saul. Uh, and uh, the Samuel. Saying, you know, God, God is not pleased with sacrifice, but obedience. And uh, the people think that they can just come in, make a sacrifice, I'm good to go, without changing their lives or obeying God. I mean, that's, you know, we, that, there, there's no submission there. There's just, okay, if I'm going to follow the numbers. Right. And I'll go, and I'm good. Right. Well, I'll, I'll appease. What I have to offer is so good that he, you know, he must, he must want it, you know, no matter what I'm doing. So I, I just need to go and appease him, and that's, that's all is needed. You Even know? if you offer the sacrifices that he requires, start talking about blood sacrifices and stuff like that, that he requires, but you do it with a heart that is unrepentant as if, okay, I got to do this, and then I'm okay. That's worth nothing. Right. That's why David in the psalm says, I, I will live with integrity in my house. You know? If you're living in your house or in the world, in the workplace, without any integrity whatsoever, and then you come to the house of God and think you can just snap into the integrity mode, you know, you can just snap on the right worship, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I heard one person say, if you're expecting God to work a miracle on you every time you go into worship, there's a problem. In other words, he was referring to you know, living like a pagan the whole entire week and then just expecting God to feed, just feed you and feed you and you're going to be all better when you're going to worship. You know? um, no. 
you know, if your heart's not in the right place and you're li living like a hypocrite, um, you know, it, you're not just going to go into worship one day and be a changed person. You have to repent. Well, you, know, you hit on something uh, interesting, though. If you think about it, and the things that you do, you always have, you always have some expectation something's going to happen or you've done something. Especially if you're, let's say, you're doing something for someone. A lot of people have an agenda that I'll do this for you if you do this for me. There's always some level, maybe some level of level of expectation. Mm -hmm. so when you go to worship, you're expecting a miracle, you're expecting something to happen because you're a worship. Right. Yeah, and, and there is a sense, as we'll talk about later, we should expect things from God in, in worship when we come to worship Him rightly. He promises us certain things, so we'll definitely get, get to that. But God doesn't owe us anything. So that's the first, like, that's the foundational attitude. I'm, I'm going to worship you, but you don't owe me anything. I owe you worship, though. <laughs> you know? So that's the first, that's the foundational attitude, I think, for the, for the Christian. That's good. I, I, I was thinking when you, were, when you were saying what you were saying about submission, and we just hate it. Um, I was thinking about Jesus' words about the judgment. Is, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. You know, so one of the reasons we don't want to submit is because when we go into worship, you know, and truly submit to him, our works are going to be exposed. And we don't, we don't like that. It's better to kind of close your ears or, you know, or, or try your best to avoid listening to the preacher or when the sermon is read, or when the scripture is read or at any point in the service. Um, it, it's, it's, it's easier to do that than sit there humbly and say, work on me however you will. I'll give anything up for you. Like the disciples' attitude when Jesus said, come and follow me. Um, so yeah, this is a big issue in worship uh, you know, for obvious reasons. Because we're, God calls us to worship him. And if we have an attitude that doesn't submit in any way, we're not having an attitude of worship. Um, what, one quick rabbit trail here about the word submission. It has, in our day, very much become almost a bad word. And I, I think it's been misunderstood as something only women are called to do. Does anyone else get that sense? It's like only used in, that, in the context of marriage. It is true, wives are to submit to the husbands as to the Lord. Paul says it very explicitly, it's said, it's said elsewhere. But in scripture, that same word is utilized for all sorts of relationships. Um, were to submit to the civil authorities, uh, submit to elders, young men to s submit to older men. Um, Paul even says, I submit to my fellow workers and co-laborers. And that's interesting because he calls certain women that he works with co-laborers and fellow workers. He said, I submit to, in other words, I submit to the people in the church. Paul even says that. Women, men. Um, so, Submission is not a bad, you know, Jesus on earth submitted to the Father, right? Submission is a good word. It's, it's humbly, uh, it, it's living a life of order and decency, knowing, um, knowing the authority structures that God has put in your life. Has it been abused, especially in marriage, by, by men uh, in, throughout, you know, has, have, has that, a passage like that, submit to your husband, has been abused by men? Well, sure. Uh, but any passage has been abused by men, right? Um, so submission's not a dirty word, and it's not, it's, it's not a word that only applies to women. It's a word that applies to every single Christian, just in different ways. Um, wives to husbands, husbands to Christ is sort of the image there in Ephesians 5. Uh, uh, children to parents, slaves to masters. I mean, there's all sorts of scripture passages about Submission. So that's a little rabbit trail, but that's, you know, uh, it, it's important today because that kind of comes our way. But you're those Christians that believe, you know, wives are, are less than their husbands. You know, and that's not the picture at all. That's not the picture at all. Um, it, the picture is, in Scripture, submission does not mean that there's an inequality. It does not mean that at all. Um, it, exactly, right, right. Jesus 521 says, submit to one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's so interesting about that passage 
Uh, again, there's no chapter and verse divisions, there's no headings in the original text. So Paul says, uh, he's talking about the church, sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to everyone out of, you know, out of reverence for Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, and then it says, wives to your husbands. Uh, in, the, in the Greek, it doesn't repeat the word submit. So it's submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, and then wives to your husbands. And then husbands, love your wives. So I think the best way to view that is how, how does a wife submit to her husband in marriage? By respect, following his leadership. How does a husband submit to his wife in marriage? By loving her as Christ has loved his church. By sacrificing himself for her. By nourishing her with the water of the word. That's, it's not the, the submission in marriage doesn't look the same because both have different roles. But, but, but obviously... You know, if, if you have a man say, you submit to me and I just do what, my, do what I want, ha, 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 that's not a Christian man, you know. So you, you're definitely, as a man, taking care of your wife and submitting to her needs, if you want to use that terminology. So, so yeah, so, so it's like Paul's saying in the church, submitting to one another, everyone. And then the rest of the book of Ephesians, he's explaining how that looks in particular situations. Husbands, wives, children, uh, fathers. I were children and parents, master slaves, they, all those different dynamics. So, all right, let's get to it. That was a longer rabbit trail than I expected. But there you go. Um, does God care simply that we worship or also how we worship? <laughs> Scriptural evidence. True worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. Good. So that's how he wants to worship. Okay, so, so there you go. That's a foundational one. Clearly there, there's a how, right? He cares about the how. It's not just worship me, period. Worship me in spirit and in truth. That's good. All right, what else? Ask me to have a Bible whether uh, God cares how you worship. You know? mm -hmm. They thought they could just flick the bit and start fire up their own way, and God said, Right. I'm sorry. Right. Like, like, let's go ahead and read that. So you can turn to Leviticus chapter 10, but. As we turn there, any other scriptural examples that we can think of? Well, Blair mentioned it, uh, yeah. when Saul decided to, to bring sacrifice, even though he did not kill uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. destroy all the animals, brought back animals, thinking that truly God would be welcoming and sacrifice. Right. <laughs> and, right. And Genesis. Genesis no. I'm sorry. The Genesis 3.5. 3 through 5. Yes, go ahead and read Genesis, that. Genesis Good. 4, excuse me. Four. Uh, in the course of time brought to, to the Lord an offering, oh, excuse me, in the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Can we continue? Sure. Yeah. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must learn to rule over it. There you go. There you go. God cares how we worship. That was the whole issue there, right? And just as a side note, that's the best sermon illustration ever, I think. Sin is crouching at your door. And what an image, like a lion in there waiting outside the tent, about to devour him, you know. It's a good, good image. All right, Leviticus chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Now, they have... No, they have Nahab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Of that last part. Aaron held his peace. Okay. There's not a lot of mourning for his mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, time to shut my mouth before I get consumed. Yeah. Now, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. 
We brought up this passage, but it's good to see it with your own eyes, I think. I guess if you're, a vis if you're not a visual learner, it doesn't matter, so just listen if you're not a visual learner. Um, st let's start, let's tra Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 28. Uh, right before this, we've been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We've come to the new Jerusalem. Um, and then, so he says this, 28, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, there's another how there, but also, where does he get this idea that our God is a consuming fire? Where do you think he's pulling that from? The, Nate, the Nadab and Abihu story, right? Where else? And there's other places. Um, but that's the clear, most explicit text that most likely he's alluding to here. I don't, I don't see any other option um, than, than that this text was on his mind when he was writing it. So he can't get into the mind of the author, but it seems very clear this is a, a, an allusion to that story. Um, so, so yes, Old Testament, God cared how they worshipped. New Testament, it's carried over and applied in the same way. Our God's a consuming fire. Better be reverent. All right. So there you go. All right. Why must the Bible be our only guide for how we worship? Assuming that that is true. If that's not true, tell me why. I don't think anyone else can say that. But, hey, got to give the option. It's allowed if you think that it's allowed. I'm not sure your opinion. <laughs> right. right. Good. Good. All right. Um, but why? You know? Let's go a little farther than that, although that is true. If, if uh, our guide is anything but the Word of God, it is, it is human invention and fallible. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how, how can you... How can you put the same faith in the words of men that you do in the, in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and, and then that, that would be correct. Right, and then expect Christians to think worship is important. Right. Yeah. Obviously, if you're making it more more loose and just allowing it to be kind of whatever the cultural moment dictates, uh, then people are going to have a lesser view of it. It's going to be more like, well, then I can, I can miss because yeah, I don't feel like good today. You know, I... I uh, I went out on the boat yesterday, or I partied a little too late, you know, or, you know, whatever excuses people make these days. Um, because it's, it's, it's sort of meant for me, you know, and it's sort of the pastor's, you know, um, sort of the pastor's service, you know, it's not God's service, right? But let's talk about two, uh, two ideas here real quick. We have the, you might have heard of this before. The regulative principle of worship, and the, uh, I guess sorry, I didn't this word, that looks cool, right? And the normative principle of worship. Has, has anyone heard these terms before? Not so much? Okay, so the regulative principle of worship is what we would say uh, is the most biblical and what we're arguing for here. Uh, and, and what this says is, let me give you the exact definition from the Westminster Confession. This is the best way to explain it. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. So, in, in other words, the regular principle is God regulates worship, period. So, how should we worship? It, it's, only the, it's only by the express words of God in Scripture. That's how we worship. And to make that even more clear, giving it the contrast, this is the other view. This is like Luther, like Luther held to this view. Uh, this is what you see all over America. Today. This is like the common, common view. It's called the normative view. Not sure why it's called normative view. Because it's not normal. Because it's not normal. That's why it's called the normative view. 
Um, um, but anyway, the normative view is um, worship, worship, you can worship God in any way as long as it's not forbidden in Scripture. So you see the difference. We want an express command, explicit or implicit, in Scripture. It has to be found in God's Word. God has to say He wants to be worshipped that way. Either implicitly or especially explicitly. They're saying, as long as he doesn't forbid, it's fair game. Did he forbid? Um, did he forbid having a a baby dedication? Fair game. Did he forbid, you know, having a? Uh, um, I don't know, come up with anything. A, a, a drama in the middle of service? You know, there was a church in our denomination who during the offering was handed out, they did a, a male ballerina performance. I won't say what church, but it, it's uh, in New York City, in Manhattan. And uh, <laughs> that they, it down. They, did a, they did a ballerina, a male, two male ballerinas did a dance. Does that does that church hold to the? No, I'm not sure they were at least but, not. But did they have tutus on? No, but it was tights. It was oh, white tights, kind of like uh, long stockings, you know, like an old male, you know, long stockings. So it, it was disturbing. But anyway, um, one of them has come out and said he disagrees with it now, and he regrets it, and, and he's come to a view like this. Um, so anyway, but uh, so you kind of see the difference, right? Regular, this is what we're arguing. Regular difference. We want it to be explicit in scripture or implicit in scripture. Um, and, and when I say implicit, I, I, I don't mean you could just make a, oh, well, implicitly, you know, we're not looking for things, stretching things, but we're saying, you know, when God says, here's an example, confess your sins to one another in, in James. Do you think then that that's forbidden to confess your sins to one another in worship, that corporately? What, what not, well, no. Nowhere in scripture do you have, when you gather together in worship, confess your sins corporately. So why do we do it? Well, because it's very clearly an act of worship. And the Bible very clearly, uh, um, it, well, in Israel, in certain narratives in the Old Testament, you can see them doing it corporately. Um, and also you have passages like in James, confess your sins to one another. So you see, it's, it's, it's not quite explicit uh, in the sense of when you gather, preach the word, you know, but it's, it's, it's clear. It's clear and it's there and it's expressed. Um, this is just saying, you know, as long as it's not forbidden. Does it make sense? All right. Terry Johnson uh, said this. This is, this is good stuff here. He said, there are only two options in worship. It can be people-centered or God-centered. It can't be both. It can't be both. So one of the risks of, of this view is if, if it's just what can't, as long as it's not forbidden, we can do it, the service is going to become people-centered. It just is, especially today in, in, in America, you know. That's exactly what the secret friendly thing yeah. has done. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, originally, originally, um, you know, there's Lutherans. Um, I'm sure you would go to a Lutheran service and it would be a great service, you know. The issue with this view is, is uh, is once it gets out there, um, it, you know, it can easily be abused. You know, um, I'm sure there's some people who hold to that view that have great services. Yeah. Um, but that's not because they have the right view. Does that make sense? All right. So, yes. These words that you're using. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have those in my book. No, no, they're, they're, no, they're they're old, but uh, but it's probably not discussed enough. But um, basically, that the idea is scriptures regulated, regulated principle, regulated by God's word alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some some words in no, no, they're not. No, so some words in theological speech um, okay. is just not everyday speech. Okay. You know, it should we change some of the words to be everyday speech? Yes, probably. So it's more understandable. But 
um, there's there's problems with that too because then then it's unclear. It, it, then it can be taken as an unclear thing, you know, and that, and that's been the issue. Some people want to get rid of, um, you know, certain theological terms so it can be more easily understood. Um, but then, just for example, at a presbytery meeting, if a if a a guy coming up uses all the new terms, it's just not clear. Like, okay, but what do you mean by that? But if he says justification is by faith by faith alone. Um, it, and, and what it means is that God forgives us of our sins and imputes to us the righteousness of Christ. Say, okay, I know what he believes. But if he tries to use this all personal, strange, boiled down language, there can be lots of confusion. So, that, like, te- there's, anyway, I'm just saying, there's a good use for technical. Technical terms are useful, but they are technical. So, Nick, they're I not in our every, everyday speech. I would also add that one of the reasons why this may be new terms is because. Uh, we have not covered the details of worship since I've been here. And we assume, because we subscribe to the Westminster Standard, Confession of Faith and Larger and Shorter Catechism, that our people are reading that, you are regular of the reading of the uh, Westminster Standards, you'll come across these terms. Gotcha. And so what we did is, as elders, when this book came across our way, was we, we realized this is something our people really need. And this is why we've gone back to re-emphasizing the need to be in the Westminster Standards because uh, A, they teach what the scriptures teach, and B, our church subscribes to it, and so we assume that our people are also up on that, and if they're not, then that's our fault as elders. We need to go back and teach them. So that's one reason why we're going step by step through this book, hoping to encourage our people to be become fresh students of the worship of God. Good. All right. These are uh, not quite as technical. Term, these are terms that are more often uh, utilized in regular everyday speech. But uh, what is the distinction between elements and circumstances? And let's 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 talk about that. Elements and cir- circumstances. What do you think an element of worship is? What's an element of worship versus a circumstance of worship? Giving glory to God. Okay. All right. So I, I'll put. I'll put praise. praise okay. Under praise, you can put singing, you know, singing praises to him. Okay? I mean, we start our worship That's good. with adoration. Right. Like call to worship, invocation, you know, the first prayer. Um, good. Yeah, that would, be ele- that would be an element. Preaching. Preaching. Okay. We're on the right track. I think we get the idea of what an element is. Reading scripture. Reading. The supper. Reading, particularly scripture. Yes. The supper. Yes. Supper. The Lord's supper. Um. What else? Anything else here? Confession. Confession. Good. Good. Um. Prayer. Prayer. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. See? Oh, okay. Collection or offering. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 16 when you got it on the first day of the week. Collect for the poor. Benediction, right? God, God uh, puts blessing. He gives you grace. He puts blessing upon you. Um, and, and there may be some more. You, the, uh, you know, baptism. Um, the... Uh, uh, ordination, you can take vows in the service, right? You usually have a charge before the benediction. Charge, right? All those things are being included. So what would be a circumstance then? What would be circumstances? Whatever what do you, you feel. Say again? Whatever you feel. What, what do you mean by that? You mean like your personal feeling when you go into worship? Yeah, might be your... That's usually the charismatic. If I understand well, this is circumstances is uh, when you feel that you need to put more music, so it's good, to, it's, it's good for you. It depends how they understand how move, what is the worship in the spirit, right? Mm-hmm. When you feel the spirit is saying, sing more, you get, you get this, yes. I hear it, so yeah, that, that, that would be more linked to, we're referring to something different here, but I, but I do get what you're saying. Oh. That, that, that would be more, you know, the normative view of worship we talked about before, 
and if, if it's not forbidden, you know, we don't need to be orderly and we could just, let's just sing more. We feel like we need to sing more, so let's sing more. Yeah. But what we're referring to here is more um, pews versus chairs. Uh, what hymnal do you use? Hymnals or projector. I'm not going to write anymore. You can't read, you can't read that. Uh, what what <laughs> hymnals you have to wear? Whether he wears a robe or not? Yes, robe, no robe, suit, tie, polo. What does the congregation wear? Uh, do you meet at 4 p.m.? Do you have two services or one service? Uh, yeah, you're wearing shorts. Is there a fog machine? Included. <laughs> Hopefully not. Does that include wet day? I mean, so yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, for us, for us, I wouldn't say it would, it would include what day. Um, because we do believe the day is, pres is, yeah. is prescribed. That's regulated by God's word. Worship on the first day of the week, the Lord's day. Um, I visited a church and they, they asked members, especially on significant like Christmas, Easter, mm -hmm. they asked members to come to the Saturday service so there would be more room for the Sunday service for visitors mm -hmm. who are not normal. I've heard, I've heard that too. A similar idea, yeah. Yeah. yeah because, so. because most Christians today don't believe uh, Sunday is the Sabbath. They think that was Saturday and that was a Jewish thing. Um, and, and frankly, that, that's an area that I don't, I don't blame them. I don't blame them for that. You know, some of the stuff they do, like, I mean, you know, hyping up people's emotions uh, artificially, I blame them for that. That's, if you can't see how that's problematic, you know. But anyway, but for, for not understanding that the Lord's Day is on the first day of the week, I, 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 do, I do understand that. That is a, you know, it's not an ABC123 thing. Uh, in fact, you know, we should do a Bible study on why we believe that. Is that that deserves its own uh, its own Bible study. The the long the short story there because I have a minute. The short story there is uh, God rested from His work of the old creation on the seventh day. He rested. Jesus finished His work of the new creation on the first day. He rested. So we worship on on that day because Jesus in Jesus' resurrection He instituted the new creation. That's the short answer. But you can see, you know, you can see, uh, and, and it's the example in Scripture that the early church did. It's very clear in Acts and in Revelation, John worships on the Lord's Day. And then in history, from we have an epistle to Barnabas, it's, it's, it's dated probably the first century, and he speaks, it speaks of worship on the, on the first day of the week. It seems to be the universal practice of the Christian church from the very beginning. Um, so... But so you can see how, how that's misunderstood. You know, it's, you know, that makes sense. All right. When Jesus appeared to the disciples on the Lord's day, they were worshiping. He not rebuked them and say, what are you doing us today? You were supposed to do this yesterday. All right. All right. This is really uh, out of the box, but uh, can you all imagine what your calendar were at home was like? Yeah. The calendar at home. What is the first day? Yeah. Not in France. France is not. Say which which day is? It? Yeah, France. Their calendar is different. They, they, okay. They consider Monday. Okay. Thursday. All right. Yeah, like, as logic, huh? Yeah, I was doing a, I was doing a Bible study re recently with uh, with some men, and uh, and you know this is a question that came up, and and I said, yeah, we worship on the first day. Here's why, and they thought I was saying Monday. Yeah, is that people think of the first day of the week as, as Sunday's the weekend. That's not the first day of the week. So, anyway, all right. Uh, so, so elements are obviously elements are obviously you know you can't get rid of any of these. This is God. God has told us to do these things in worship. We do these things. Um, circumstances, you know, you can. We have chairs. I prefer pews, but you know, hey, that's just preference. It's cool. Uh, we start at 10.30 a.m. Some churches start at 12 or 8 a.m. You know, so these, these are things that can change depending on the, the type of church, on the people, the culture. There's all sorts of things that go, go into that. But do these matter? What will they do? I mean, wisdom should go into these things. A session should pray about them, consider them. They're, they're not, you know, they're not, we need not be indifferent about them. They do matter to some degree, but in a totally different sense than, than these matter. Okay. All right. In what way can it be said that God serves us in 
the worship service? I will answer this question as we close since we're uh, running out of time here. Uh, Robert Neatham says this. This is a great quote. Listen to this. We are inclined to view our worship as what we do. But it is first and foremost something the triune God does. Our actions are initiated and encompassed by His. Okay, so that's the first point here. How does, how does God serve us in worship? The first thing you need to know is that God is the one acting in worship first and foremost. This is something that He is doing for His people. Right? The Lord's Supper is something that He is doing. Preaching is something He is doing. Right? Uh, baptism is, is His declaration upon the person being baptized. Okay? God, in the book, He says this, God serves us in grace. We serve Him in gratitude. God serves us in grace, and we serve Him in gratitude. So who's the first one acting there? God. And is that not like your salvation? Right? Worship follows the pattern of your salvation. God called out to you. I love that little section in Paul where he says, it's in Galatians 4, and it's just in passing. And, uh, and, and, and he says, when you have come to know God, or rather God has come to know you. He, he, so he, it's almost like he's, uh, he's fixing himself as he's, as he's right. You have come to know God. Oh, rather, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. But that's true. God came to know you. He called, out, he called you out of the world. He sent you His Spirit, and everything you're doing is responding to that. And that's worship. That's worship. He's the one acting. So how does He, how does he serve us? He serves us in grace. He feeds us. And this is why modern worship uh, is, uh, that is mostly just singing and praise is, pro is problematic. Uh, do we have more to offer God than He has for us? Singing and praise is, is an element. We don't get rid of that. But if that's the only element, a lot of churches just have, as we talked about in the past, they, most of the service, 40 minutes, is, is singing. There's very short prayers, very, very small, maybe one prayer, two prayers, uh, a, a short homily, like 10 to 15 minutes typically, right, and, then, and then that's it. So the majority of the service is praise, and it's almost, it's almost as if we have more to offer him than he has for us. You see? Um, but that's, of course, not the truth. Worship is first and foremost where God feeds his people. He's feeding his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. And, and we need green grass to feed. Yeah, I mean, how wonderful is the statement that Jesus says, man, man cannot live by bread alone. Right? That should be our attitude when we go into worship. That should be like a central thing on our minds. Like, this is something I need for survival. I need the Lord to feed me this morning. We open our mouths and he promises to fill them. So God serves us in worship, feeding us his grace. Yes, question? Or oh, a statement? I, I, was, I was just thinking that, uh, it was about a year ago, we... we you just turn to Psalm 81 as, as we're talking. About a year ago, we resumed meeting after the whole COVID... Uh, uh, or shut down, and it was it was different. I, you know, I missed Michelle was telling me she said I missed that. She said it, it uh, you know not expecting to miss it as much as as we did. As we, uh, yeah, we we tuned in uh, on the TV or Zoom or whatever we used, but it it, it wasn't the same. It was there was yeah. something really lacking. Why have hands again? We won't shut down. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh. The, yeah. That's another discussion that that uh, that gets that gets talked about a lot. Is uh, why can't I just watch TV? You know, watch the sermon from home or or, or whatnot. It's, especially with young, especially with young uh, evangelicals. You know, why my church offers this big even before the before COVID hit. Um, that was a big, a big topic. They just, they didn't get it because they go in and it's entertainment. They don't know anyone and they leave. So if that's all churches, I get it. Yeah, you could watch it for a moment. It's the same. What does it matter? Um, but that's, you know, I, I blame the churches 
work, you know, form of worship and satellite churches and all the, those strange ideas for for create for creating that just as much as the as the person's view, you know the person's view is because they've only been in churches like that you know if they if they been to, if they went to a, a church with a more um, some sort of it doesn't need to necessarily be a reform reformed church but some sort of reformed order um, for a year or two and go back to that and be like what is this like, like totally you know what is this all right Psalm eighty one. Psalm 81, put your worship hat on, okay, put your worship hat on, and see how much this has to say about worship. It's pretty phenomenal. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieve your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you, O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign god. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him, and their faith would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Amen. Amen. This sort of is giving us, to bring it back full circle, so, somewhat giving us a reason to shut our mouths and guard our steps when we go to the house of God to worship. Right? I'm, I'm, oh, that they would listen to me. Quoting directly from the book, the mm -hmm. worship book. The God-centered worship service is the garden in which faith is planted, grown, and cultivated. Mm -hmm. uh, same principle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Amen. And coming to um, you come hungry right. yeah, so that he will feed you. Right. So with that attitude. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same Nothing in my hands. In my hands, I bring simply to thy cross. I clean. You know, in worship, you come. You come empty. I, I need to be fed. You know. Yes, that should be our attitude every day we wake up. But how much more on the big day, on the most important day of the week, the day of the day of rest? Um, I, I like thinking about. And this isn't my own thought. I've heard this somewhere. So uh, I didn't come up with it. Uh, but I. I like thinking about the w private worship or family worship during the week as practicing for the for the game day. You know? This is the game day, you know, uh, and everything you do up during the week is practice for that big day. And the practice is very vital for your health and for your ability to perform on the big game day. Uh, so we're not lessening that when we talk about worship, corporate worship, as this vital thing. It's just that this is the this is the game day. 